Hey friends, we are here today for a really incredible conversation. I'm very excited to have it because mental health means the world to me. And I believe that we should all have a mental health practice, a daily practice at Miracle Morning where we start our day, we have habits that are going to move us forward and keep our mind healthy while we keep our bodies healthy. It's that mind, body, soul connection that ultimately helps us to become whole and be able to function and grow and do all the things that we really have been called to do. My guest today is the entrepreneur's therapist, and I am so excited to introduce you to her. We're going to talk about how you can create a mental health plan, similar to how you create a business plan, because you will not be successful with that business plan if your mind is not healthy. So we're going to go even deeper than just mindset today and talk about mental health and how you can create a mental health strategy for your business. And also we're going to talk about spirituality and how spirituality and faith can be a huge component to drive success because I'm not going to give anything away. We're going to talk about it with our guests. So without further ado, Shula Meet Bear Levtov, welcome to the Robin Graham Show. Hi, Robin. What a delight to be here. Thank you. I'm happy to have you. And just in our little conversation before we hit record, there's a connection here. We have a lot of similar beliefs and our goal, our ultimate mission to help female entrepreneurs build successful businesses and start with a foundation that's going to allow them to grow and achieve the success of their dreams. It's a bond we share. So I'm excited to really dive into this conversation on a deeper level and help the listeners, help everyone out there who hears this episode to be able to grow and better care for themselves ultimately, because we know that Mm. the more healthy our mind, body, soul connection is the healthier our business is going to be. And the healthier all of our relationships are going to be as we go through this journey of life. So with all of that said, I would love to have you tell everyone just a little bit about you and what brought you to the journey that you're on today. I'm 58. So I have a long story. I'll give you the Reader's Digest condensed version. When I left high school and went to university, I started in social work, but I got diverted into other things when I was in school and was ultimately a translator, a French to English translator, a very Canadian kind of career. And, but it was a a translator's work with documents. And so we're typing all the time. And I had a typing injury and I had to do my own occupational rehab. And so I had side hustles all along of supporting women in their mental health and personal growth. So it made sense to really make that my full-time thing, to go back to school, back to my roots, get a degree in counseling. In this case, it was a master's in counseling and spirituality and go into private practice. Also as a woman, I was in my mid forties when I did this, there was nobody who was going to hire like a 50 year old woman coming new into the job market, right? Which is another reason. So many of us women entrepreneurs or women who are self-employed, we do this because we are creating our own opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So that's how I went into private practice as a therapist, but I was aware of a couple things when I graduated from school and you as a business coach will know this, that when we get our training in our career, we are good at our, what's the word in English, good at our craft, Mm -hmm. but we don't know how to run a business. And we also know that most small businesses fail in the first year. And since this was my rest of life sustainability plan, I jumped right away into business coaching, business classes, business programs, because I wanted to make sure that my business succeeded as a therapist. As a therapist, though, I was the only therapist hanging out with entrepreneurs and people in in small businesses. And in my own entrepreneurial journey, as I opened a holistic clinic and as I hung out with like people at the Chamber of Commerce and other kinds of old school, straight up business networking situations, I think people, because I was a therapist, they would confide in me a bit more about what they were going through than they might tell like the person who has the shop across the street from them. And I came to understand how difficult it is on your emotional life and your mental health to run your own business. And it became clear that there were no therapists at the time who understood the intersection of business and mental health. And that's how I became the entrepreneur's therapist. I love it so much. So you're so right on so many levels. And it's funny that I know 
only a couple of therapists who actually have that entrepreneurial mindset where they're active, mm -hmm. actively promoting their business. They're active online. They are present. They're communicating. They are sharing what they do and who they serve and how they serve them. And they're giving advice and tips to bring people in to attract people. But most therapists, mm -hmm. this is going to sound stereotypical, but I think that it's a justified stereotype that they're just in the trenches seeing patients every day and they're not thinking about future growth. What happens when these patients get better? Yes, right now there's an influx of care. There's an influx of patients, especially because of COVID. But what happens when those people are gone? How do you retain those clients? How do you get new clients and attract new clients? So I love that you have taken this and merged it and also focused on the fact that Mental health is such a huge component to the entrepreneurial journey, whether you're a therapist or a business coach or whatever else you are, because you're alone. Most of us are high achieving women. We push ourselves. We want everything to be perfect. We don't make the decision to delegate soon enough and we become burnt out. So there's so many facets to this. So mm -hmm. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about the types of challenges, the mental health, maybe even fatigue is a good word that people come to you with. Sure. As you mentioned, so many women entrepreneurs are independent, strong women who are driven, who want to create something for themselves. And that's hard work. Doing that kind of work is really demanding. And then if you have a spouse, you have children, you have community responsibilities, like your plate is very full. And it's just, even in the case of good things, there's a demand on your nervous system. And at a certain point, what happens is for the women who come to me in any case, they hit a wall. They're like, I've overcome X, Y, Z, and now all of a sudden I can't handle the smallest thing. I'm overwhelmed, I'm burnt out, I'm anxious all the time, I'm depressed. It's one of those kinds of things. I've hit a wall and I want my old self back and I don't know how to get there. It's the cumulative impact of running a business without taking care of yourself. And it's a complex, as a person with anxiety, it's a complex thing to take care of yourself because I don't mean to say that the women who come to work with me are women who don't know what self-care is and who don't take care of themselves, but it's what they have been doing has not been enough. And I they think need there's some controversy over what self-care is as well. Yes, I, it, yes. It's not just going to the spa and getting your nails done. There's so much more depth to self-care. And I interviewed a woman, Sarah Palmer, and I will link that episode in the show notes because it, she talked about different ways that you can implement self-care in your life without having to spend exorbitant amounts of money or leave your home and different things like that. There are certain ways that you can care for yourself without adding additional stress and taxation on your mind. Right. Because it just becomes another chore to clear your schedule and to find the money to take a time out. But again, as you probably know, with the nervous system and anxiety, there's a baseline level of activation in our nervous system that we need to be able to respond. The stress response in the body is what makes us able to be the people we are, to meet the challenges of the day to day. And we wanna make sure that baseline level is at a certain place within our window of tolerance. And if our baseline level of activation of our nervous system is constantly right at the top of our window of tolerance, then when the crap hits the fan, we peak outside the window of tolerance and then we have panic attacks breakdowns or we crash we burn out that kind of thing and it's the teeny weeny itty bitty moment to moment practices that help us regulate our nervous system so that it stays on a it's a it's like rolling hills within the window of tolerance it's not like it's a flat line and we never get upset we do but the degree to which we get upset stays within that window of tolerance. And so when it comes to self-care, it's every hour having a timer that rings so that you stand up for five minutes and gaze out the window or you voxer your BFF, your biz BFF and say, I'm having a tough moment. So that gives you an opportunity to de-stress. It's these micro moments of self-care, in other words, nervous system regulation that really are most powerful 
more so that's why you can go away to the spa and come back and still be a wreck or you can go on vacation and you feel great on vacation and then come back to your business and can't cope because mm -hmm. you need something on like small doable things that you repeat over and over again. I love that so much because really, and the fact that you mentioned look out the window, I think when we take a second mm. to look at the world around us and how incredibly beautiful yes. it is, it just yes. puts things in perspective and you can go for a walk around the block. You can go and smell a flower, but tap into what is there in front of you that we often overlook because we aren't stopping to take a moment to just appreciate it. And I think when we do that, we cleanse our mind, but we also tap into our own creativity. And when we tap into creativity, yeah. the, I think the world, our mind, our bodies, everything open up to be able to focus better, to be able to feel healthy and motivated and inspired. And we did have another episode on creativity. So I'm, instead of talking about that here, I'll link that in the show notes because Alex Cap gave us a wealth of information on tapping into our creativity. But I love mm -hmm. that you said that just getting back in touch to, with our roots, nature, the earth. And all of those yes. things around us that are so yeah. miraculous. So when you talk about this and creating a plan, a mental health plan for our lives, just like we would create a business plan for our entrepreneurial journey, let's mm. talk about that. What are the steps that one can take to actually create and then adhere to, or I should say, create, implement, and adhere to this plan? Yes. Yes. If you have a business plan, you might be familiar with the acronym KPI or key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. And this is a concept that can be applied to mental health. There are lag indicators and lead indicators in your business, and there are lag indicators and lead indicators for your mental health. So I'll just briefly explain because sometimes people don't know what those terms are. So a lag indicator is the impact of the lead indicator. So the lead indicator are the tactics and strategies that you implement and the lag indicators are the outcomes or the effect or the impact of the strategies and tactics. So when it comes to your mental health plan, usually people find it very easy to identify symptoms. They can easily identify what they don't, what's happening now that they don't like. And that's one aspect of the lag indicator for your mental health is I'm not sleeping, I'm having panic attacks, my digestion is off, I have trouble making decisions, I can't focus. Those are lag indicators that reflect something going on in your life either yesterday or last week or cumulatively over time. So lead indicators can be something for those lag indicators, lead indicators could be something like high stress in the business, lost a client, dip in revenue. So we want to be able to identify how you know you're doing well with your mental health and how you know you're not doing well with your, not doing well with your mental health. Those are your lag indicators, right? And usually you will know in your lead indicators, that's what we would call in quotation marks, your self-care practices. So for example, some people know that if they run every day, that's a lead indicator. And when they find down the road, like that I can't concentrate and that my anxiety is pretty high. And then they realize, oh, I didn't run all, at all this week. There's a direct relationship between not running and the fact that they're not feeling right. So you identify your lead indicators. What are the things that I always do that help me feel good? So that's the very first level. And once you've identified those things, then you take stock, just like you do a weekly review with your business, or you do the 90 day planning, right? And you do your quarterly plan, your monthly plan, your weekly plan, your daily plan, but then you check in weekly mm -hmm. and you look at how things are, what results you're getting for the efforts you're putting in exactly the same way with your mental health. You look at, first of all, you evaluate your leg indicators. How am I feeling today? And then you look at, okay, what have I been doing? that has led to me feeling this way. And it could be either good or bad, right? And just that insight, oh, I feel great. And I've been doing this. I'm going to keep doing this because it's gonna keep me feeling great. Or I'm feeling crappy right now. And here's the thing. Often people come to me and say, What's the matter with me, I shouldn't be feeling the way I'm feeling. 50% of people's distress is caused by what they tell themselves about what they're feeling. That I shouldn't be feeling like this. What's the matter with you? Pull your socks up and get going. Don't be weak. 
you know, that kind of stuff. 50% of people's distress is caused by, in my experience, how they talk to themselves. Mm -hmm. And with this weekly review, you can alleviate that for yourself because you're feeling crappy. And then you look back and go, oh my goodness, I lost a big client on Monday. And Monday I was upset because I was aware that I had just lost a client, but two weeks later, I forget about that. And then I remember, oh yeah, I lost a client two weeks ago. No wonder I'm feeling more stressed now than I do usually. And that move alone can really help a lot to see that that's a lead indicator. It was two weeks ago, but it was something that happened to me that is having an impact on me and my mental health now. So the weekly review is a really important aspect of implementation after you've identified what are your, in general, your lag and lead indicators. That's excellent. And I think it's something we take time to review our numbers, our lot profit and loss statements and all of these things, but we don't yep. take time to check in with ourselves. So I think this is so incredibly important. Yeah. So when you have someone come to you and they have all these symptoms and they're not feeling themselves and they want to get back to the basics of who they are at the core and feel strong and healthy again, to do this process with your lag and lead indicators and everything, do you recommend journaling? Do you recommend meditation? Do you have little things that you recommend people do on a daily, weekly basis just to touch base with themselves? What I have found is that there's a lot of uh, popular advice for things like meditation is good for you. Exercise is good for you. It's very prescriptive, right? That there's a lot of recommendations around specific things to do. And in my experience, people are unique, of course. This is not newsflash to anybody. How this applies in the mental health arena is that what works for one person may not work for another. So the way I talk about these things is in terms of three principles, soothe, discharge, and nourish. And so part of when we look at, when we develop a person's list of lead indicators, we break down what soothes them, their nervous system, what nourishes them, their nervous system, their spirit, their mind, their body, and what discharges them. Because for some people, for example, a hot bath can be really soothing and other people hate the heat. And in fact, it aggravates them and it doesn't help at all. So even though, or deep breathing is another very common recommendation. If you're stressed, just take a deep breath. Actually, it's quite paradoxical for trauma survivors. Taking a deep breath can actually activate anxiety. And there's a whole reason for that. It's a completely logical thing, but it just is the point is that it's not a one size fits all. So we explore the principles of soothe, discharge and nourish to see how they can apply those in practice in their lives to support themselves. I love that so much because everybody talks about meditation and I have often felt like a failure because it's not something that I can easily do. I am right, no. very easily distracted. But I can take pen to paper and I can get all this junk out of my head. And when I get it out of my head and then I transfer any negative thoughts and feelings to positive, I can shift my entire being, my mental aspect, the shoulders drop, everything, the tension releases, all of that stuff. But to sit and meditate is extremely challenging for me. And part of yeah. maybe... That's because my house is so chaotic. I don't know, but <laughs> people in and out and dogs everywhere. So I love that you say that it's really and truly a customized individual approach and it's what works for the individual. And anybody listening to this could actually discover the soothe, discharge and nourish. Yeah. All um, they have to do is some philosophy. brainstorming around that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And like for me, it's, and I know I've mentioned this on the show before, like my morning practice is my devotions, my journaling, and then some reading and then exercise. And as long as I do that, my week can go pretty smoothly, but I will notice, like you said, if I miss something, if I don't get a certain level of cardiovascular activity or a certain level of strength training or whatever, I will notice that in how I'm responding and reacting to different situations. And I think it's really important that we look at, okay, how do we nourish our body? So is it healthy food? Is it avoiding junk food? Is it exercise? Is it journaling? Is it reading? Mm -hmm. Is it walking out in nature? Is it hiking, exploring? There's so many different things we can do to tap into something that is going to soothe us. Yeah. So soothing has to do with invoking what's called the relaxation response. It's down-regulating the nervous system. So anything that makes you go, ah, oh. and that is so unique to each person. 
Discharge has to do with physical movement because stress activates the body to respond physiologically. And of course, we're not bunnies. There are no bears, but the brain thinks, oh my gosh, there's a bear. So the body still needs to move to quote unquote, run from the bear. And so you need to find your own way of moving, but also emotions emotion they're meant to be in motion have to mm -hmm. find a way to discharge the emotion as well in a way that works for us and then nourishment is such a wide category it has to do with what like physiologically but also spiritually and mentally what uplifts and energizes us and carries us gives us a sense of meaning and connection so it can be understood nourish at a very basic level strictly on the physical body level, but it can also then be taken to be interpersonally, communally, and then spiritually as well. There are many, mm -hmm. nourish is a very wide category that a person can take, depending on their preference and their orientation, they can use it as complex and holistically as they want or as simply as I love that so much. I think that's so important. So you mentioned spirituality and I want to dive into this and the listeners yeah. know that faith is so very important to me. And before we hit record, you and I were talking about how faith can truly become a foundation for everything that we do. And mm -hmm. I love the fact that you're Jewish, I'm Christian, but we can come together and have a conversation that is meaningful and impactful about faith and how important mm -hmm. it is to have that sense of belonging, that sense of, of God giving us a purpose, giving us a calling, providing the guidance we need, keeping us grounded. We don't have to bear all these things alone, even if we are a solo person. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to talk about that and how spirituality does come into play for mental health. So it's many of the people who come to me, although I'm clear about my orientation towards spirituality in how I present myself, many people, unlike you, I think, where you draw Christian entrepreneurs to you because they want to work with somebody who has a Christian orientation, people don't come to me wanting the spiritual aspect. And I'm sure you've also observed that we live in a world where there is less and less communal affiliation, right? And so my take on that, even before my degree, was that it's a I'm, I'm looking for the word. I'm just going to pause and let it come to me. Like when I think about it, there's a little kind of ache in my heart around the absence of something and, and it causes distress. And so I will see this in the people who come to me, that there's something missing, that we can do all the things and still there's just this something missing. And a way of talking about it that I have discovered through my training and my experience that's accessible to people who are unaffiliated is to talk about it in the language that you've used of meaning and purpose, or sometimes values, where if you have a sense that there is something at work in the world greater than you, and it could simply be justice, for example, that I liked Dr. Martin Luther King said, the arc of the universe bends toward justice, right? Mm -hmm. And so maybe you're not a faithful, faith hyphen full person, but justice means something to you. It's an important value for you. This can give you the sense of meaning and purpose, and it can feed and nourish your work. And so a lot of the work that I do around what you and I would call spirituality with my clients is around finding a foundation of meaning or purpose or values that then we get excited about bringing our values to life in the world. And when we're having a hard time and we wonder, what am I doing this for that I can touch into my values? And I see my values as having their root in the divine. And that's how I see it. That's how you see it. It's not necessary to see that, but to have that sense that there are forces, greater forces than me as a single person at work in this world, I find is such a helpful way for people when the going gets tough. Mm -hmm. Because as you say, then you're not alone in the dark with the whole weight of things. You have, the way I would say it is God's hand is present in, in our neighbor, in the sunshine, in my kitty cat, and to just 
open our eyes to the presence of these greater forces in the world can be so nourishing. And I love that you brought in values because I fully believe that when we are aligned with our values, our mental health is better because we're not anxious about the decisions we're making. We're not questioning our behaviors. We're not questioning the people we're surrounding ourselves with. We're adhering to those values that are so important to us. And we're aligning ourselves with people with similar values or who respect our values. And I think that is so critical for making decisions and, and just being overall healthy from a mental health yes. perspective. Yes. Um, there's a, I want, there's a term called moral injury in the mental health field that speaks speaks to the trauma experienced by people who are required in the course of their life or in particular of their profession to violate their personal values. They experience moral injury, which is traumatic, mm -hmm. can lead to PTSD and burnout and all kinds of other things. So while you're talking about it in a generic way that like, yes, going against your values is harmful for your mental health, the research confirms, the academic research confirms what you're saying. So yeah. we have the our, just our personal sense of what happens in the world, that th this is a truism that when you violate your values, you feel bad. But we also see this in the research that it's a fact that we can experience moral injury when that happens. Mm -hmm. I think that's a bonus for entrepreneurs. Like when you work for someone else and you're in a corporate environment, sometimes you're subjected to yep. do things because you're being told like, this is what you do or you lose your job. And people can, yeah. you can see the tug of war that they can have in, internally, yeah. but as entrepreneurs, we decide who we're bringing on as clients, who we're going to attract, the message that we're putting out into the world. If we live and display our value, live by and display our values, then we're going to attract the right people to us. We're going to make better decisions and we're going to feel better at the end of the day. So I love that you brought values into this. And, yeah. and like you said, as far as that spirituality component, I, I often look at people and I think, how are you getting through every day without faith? To me, that faith just, it empowers me, it keeps me grounded. And like you said, then you're not alone. And I just, I love that as just a source of comfort in the everyday. So I love that you tie that into your practice. I think it's so important. Yeah. Okay. So lastly, we're jumping back to the business aspect of this, but when you talk about your mental health plan, you talk about bringing people back to the place of being the CEO of their business. So I would love for mm -hmm. you to just talk about that a little bit, and then we'll wrap up. Sure. So the term I use is CEO self, because not everybody necessarily identifies as CEO per se as a, it's, it, I use the term CEO self because it refers to the neuroscience, the neuropsychology of mental health. So what happens is, and I talked earlier about the window of tolerance and your baseline level of regulation. When we're within our window of tolerance, our prefrontal cortex is available to us. And the prefrontal cortex is what I call the CEO self. It's where our higher functions reside. And I'm sure as working with anxiety, you're well aware of this, the brain science behind this, right? That our creativity, our problem solving, our moral reasoning, our, all our higher functions have their home in the prefrontal cortex. That's the CEO self. When mm -hmm. our baseline level of activation goes out of the window of tolerance, we literally flip our lids. That is to say that the prefrontal cortex stops communicating with the rest of the brain. And we lose access to our CEO self, all our wisdom, our creativity, all our great powers, our sense of connectedness with others and with the divine becomes unavailable to us. And so when we understand how to work with and regulate the nervous system, then we have, we are, our CEO self is in full communication with us and we can access the best of ourselves, our hearts and our minds. And really when we're wearing so many hats in our businesses, where as a solopreneur or a micropreneur, we 
have to understand the financial side, the marketing side, the client service side. We have to understand how to work with folks who are difficult. We have to be able to manage contractors. Like it's enormous cognitive load. We need mm -hmm. our a CEO self available to us for that. I love that description so much. And you mentioned earlier too, and I love the complexity of the brain. Like I'm such a geek when it comes to this. I love brain science. But when we think about the fact that negativity bias, uh, that lends us to look for the negative two thirds more often than we're going to look for the positive. We hold on to the negative for way longer than we hold on to the positive. Our amygdala in the limbic brain is working overtime with the fight, flight, or freeze. And so when you see that you're becoming more irritable, more almost irrational, unable to tap into your creativity yeah. and your resources, it goes all the way back to our ancestors, the cavemen and how they had to live in a constant state of fight or freeze to save themselves. We, like you said earlier, we're not a rabbit. We don't have the bear, but we do still have those functions in the brain. So I, oh gosh, I so love yeah. that you talked about that prefrontal cortex and how that is the CEO self. That's such a great way to look at it. And then to do all of these things to create this mental health plan so that we can keep that CEO self in check, focus, doing what it need we it needs to do to keep us moving forward in our business. Okay. Yeah. Shulamate, this was such a great conversation. I'm so grateful that you took time to be here with us today. Will you tell the listeners how they can connect with you, learn more from you and all that good stuff? Sure. So you, a great place to start is the entrepreneur's therapist on Instagram. There's a link in my bio that connects you to all kinds of yummy stuff, all kinds of resources. And there's an invitation there to have to sign up for a free assess and recommend a uh, call with me. And that would be, or you can DM me. Those would be the two ways to connect directly if you want to reach out. And if you just want to kind of get connected in a wider sense, there's a link there to sign up with my newsletter, or you can just follow me on Instagram. That's awesome. I will put the link to your website and to your Instagram in the show notes. So thank you listeners. You can simply click and head right over to connect with Shulamit and enjoy her content. She puts out some great content, very inspiring and helpful, useful. It's not fluff. It's like stuff that you can actually walk away from her feed and feel like, oh gosh, okay. I can implement that today. So I appreciate you. I appreciate everything you're doing to help entrepreneurs navigate the entrepreneurial journey, but stay mentally healthy and sound and physically healthy and sound while they're doing so. Listeners, if you enjoyed this episode, I would so appreciate it if you'd leave us a rating and review that will help us get this message out to more and more people. I think as this journey is challenging and we need to all support each other and work together to make sure that we all stay mentally healthy, because what's that going to do? That's going to help us create that ripple effect of good in the world. And that is ultimately what we're on this journey for is to support, serve, help, and be there for other people. So let's work together to do that. So please leave a rating review, share this episode with anyone you know who might be struggling. And that's it. That's a wrap for today. And I'll see you next week.